Congressman, uh, thank you so much for taking the time to join me today. Great to be with you. Thanks. I want to talk to you about a number of things, but first off, I got to ask you, uh, you, when you were first elected, uh, were, I believe, the youngest member of Congress at the time, uh, which means that you have seen a lot. Uh, and I know that there was some discussion about whether you were going to come back for another go round uh, at certain points. Um, how have you not gotten tired of Congress when so many other people have over the portion of time that you um, Now, I, I'll tell you, the, the fact that the job is ever changing. Um, I um, spent most of my time working on policy, and then I served uh, in leadership for five years as Chief Deputy Whip, which is kind of the COO of the counting operation uh, of getting votes on the floor. And now I'm back at committee doing policy. Uh, in the minority for four years and now in the majority. And those there are such different jobs. And so while I've been here for 18 years, I've had um, at least four distinct jobs um, here in Congress. And that's what keeps it interesting. And then the change of people. I like people. I like policy. Um, and uh, we're obviously all sport to politics. So the, the fact that I get to do this um, – and I can actually, um, uh, you know, pay my mortgage and, and feed my family. It's like, it, it's pretty cool. It's, it's very cool to be a part of it. So um, that's what keeps me going is the opportunity to actually make a difference and to make a change and, and have uh, attempt to have an, an impact. I uh, want to talk about a number of different issues with you. But first off, this uh, week you had – this hearing on China that seems to be, you know, one of the things where there is a rare uh, element of bipartisan consensus in certain mm -hmm. areas of policy as it relates to China, or at least in terms of, of attitude toward uh, dealing with some of the problems and uh, the challenges that we face in dealing with them. Coming in the aftermath of this spy balloon that, you know, uh, the whole country seemed to wake up to and be obsessed with uh, as it traversed our shores. Do you think that there is going to be an opportunity to make some distinct uh, shifts in policy that push back against Chinese dominance in certain areas? Yes. And I think we have to uh, write a new rule book of our engagement with China. Um, the investments they're able to make here in the United States, um, the things that they're able to access here in our markets. But I think we have to approach this from a principle uh, a principles-based um, thought process. Um, I think what we have to do is make sure that uh, we don't advantage um, China and our marketplace, uh, that we make sure that their diplomatic efforts uh, through indebting the third world to them um, and a number of other, other functions that they are trying to uh, put in place uh, through uh, d diplomatic and economic ties, that we disadvantage them in the international community. And then third and finally, we've got to make ourselves better. Uh, and that means we've got to be a better version of ourselves with free markets, um, competitive uh, marketplace, constitutional rights, property rights, speech rights, free speech rights. So we've got to be a better version of ourselves to outcompete. Uh, they're centralized, we're decentralized. And we need to double down on that distinction our open market will win out. And our, it's our free markets, though, that it gives us this power. Um, so we have to make sure that we, that we cut out the parasite uh, without sacrificing the host. Mm -hmm. And that parasite is clearly China. And that host that is um, allowing them to grow stronger, that's access to our markets. And, and so we have to think about this in a very different way, especially in light of their, their uh, really aggressive public uh, actions they've taken against us. And, and the balloon is really the best, um, best example of their disdain for, for, um, uh, for us. Mm -hmm. The president uh, sounded some notes in the State of the Union. Many commentators have said uh, that sound uh, a lot like former President Trump in, in certain ways mm -hmm. about the importance of uh, kind of national policy and buying American and, you know, uh, obviously members of his party have stressed the importance of onshoring and different things like that. The idea of you know, too many jobs having walked away over the course of the uh, past several decades when uh, I think the president sometimes acts as if he was not in politics. Uh, there obviously is, you know, some things that sound the same, 
but there are also you know different approaches that could be viewed as very anti free market. How do you uh, solve that problem? How do you give the kind of results that Americans seem to have a political appetite for uh, in terms of the uh, in terms of these outcomes without sacrificing those free market principles that you just talked about? We have to lead. We have to lead by example with policy that that drives that conversation. Uh, Speaker McCarthy made the decision to set up the China Select Committee that Mike Gallagher is going to head. Um, that vote to set up a China Select Committee uh, included all Republicans voting yes and a majority of the Democrats in the House voting yes. So that shows that there's inclination uh, to to a more concerted effort against China or to counter China. Um, but what we have to do is lead with policy and votes and drive the conversation and, if needed, embarrass Democrats into doing the right thing to counter uh, the Chinese efforts. Mm -hmm. But I, as I said, with the, the principles-based approach, I think we have to take, uh, we have to focus on making sure that we're a better version of ourselves. We can't be more centralized and try to outcompete them on centralizing. Communists will always win on that. Um, and so we have to make sure that we're a better version of ourselves to outcompete them uh, for the next generation, for the next 50 years. You know, there's a lot of concern, I think, that at the end of the day, even with bipartisan consensus in certain aspects of uh, this China situation, Congress has been so incapable of getting things done in a big way uh, for so many years on so many fronts that this will be another missed opportunity. Uh, how do you avoid having that happen? And what are some of the areas where you could see a significant number of Democrats coming along with a pro-market solution or something that uh, you would be in favor of and your fellow fiscal conservatives would be in favor of? Um, well, in my committee, I think we're, we'll, we'll focus on the Financial Services Committee. Uh, when we have sanctions, we need to have specific sanctions against specific companies um, and specific people. Uh, this is what uh, uh, the President Trump's executive order did was uh, use our national security database and national security information and make sure that's communicated with the Commerce Department. So the Department of Defense has a list uh, of uh, malign actors and their individuals and companies. And then the Commerce Department doesn't use that same list. So we need to use the best information um, and target the worst actors here. The fact that we're still debating whether or not to cut TikTok off from extracting data from uh, Americans uh, shows the absurdity of our current process. We've got to go clean this thing up. But it's a rules-based regime that includes people's ability to have uh, to object and a legal process to do that. And so that's very much consistent with American policy, uh, and it gives people rights uh, to make decisions, and it doesn't simply put that in the hands of the government to make decisions for the private sector. So that's the type of reform uh, in one segment we need to take on. When it comes to national security and microchips and how we purchase and where we purchase, trade agreements make a big difference. You look at USMCA aligning Mexico and Canada, our closest neighbors and trading partners, with us. President Trump did that. Um, and he built on bipartisan work for the last 30 years on trade policy. So you can open up markets, but also strengthen American manufacturing and American competition. And I think we're at the, a better balance now um, as Republicans than we were 10 years ago, frankly. And I think that's the type of engagement we have that don't sacrifice, that doesn't sacrifice our market and opens up new opportunities for people to be more aligned with us in this competition with China. One last China question before we move on to other things. You, you bring up TikTok. It seems to me obvious that, you know, the vast majority of people who are active in politics in Washington are well aware of the national security concerns, the intelligence concerns related to TikTok. Uh, but it also seems to me that the broader American community of TikTok users, and more importantly, the parents of TikTok users, are less aware of that they're more aware of the damage that it's doing to a lot mm -hmm. of their teenagers, to particularly teenage girls, where, you know, TikTok use has been tied in ways 
much larger than other social media actors, depending on the studies that you believe, to you know higher rates of gender dysphoria, higher rates of uh, you know issues with eating disorders and the like, a number of other sort of mental health issues that are of concern to parents, to moms and the like. How can people who are concerned about TikTok from a national security perspective expand that conversation to the people who are concerned about it more from a mental health and the health of their teenagers perspective? Um, well, I think it's a work of communicating. Um, and that is a, a, a cultural understanding we have to have uh, of what uh, certain uh, certain types of social media uh, does to young people um, and what we're doing to young people um, with bad policy uh, and cutting them off from the world and engagement with their peers directly and putting them in a, into a digital setting is has been quite harmful over the last 20 years. Mm-hmm. Um, but I subscribe to the belief, uh, and somebody else coined this, this term, but that TikTok is cultural fentanyl. Mm-hmm. I mean, this is just nasty stuff, um, and it's and it's hurting Americans. Um, and so, you know, there's a, there are a number of reasons why we should take action against TikTok, but national security being part of it, but the the the, the harmful impact on mental health and um, and suicide rates is 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 a real one. It's been it's been well measured. So uh, raising awareness, I think, is, is highly important. So let's talk about, obviously, the conversation around the debt ceiling is one uh, where you're put in the position of being a significant figure on this for all manner of reasons. And we've heard the demagoguery on this from the White House and from the president and the State of the Union. We've heard the pushback. Uh, from Republicans on, uh, you know, entitlements not being a major part of this discussion. At the same time, don't Medicare and Social Security need reform in order to be around when you and I actually need it? Yes. Um, <laughs> so the debt ceiling, yes, I agree. Um, and the absurdity of the uh, uh, State of the Union speech, not to mention how disjointed and bizarre moments were, um, but this idea that the president wouldn't negotiate around the debt ceiling, um, he forgot about him. He was vice president and negotiated on behalf of President Obama around two debt ceiling, mm-hmm. uh, uh, two major debt ceiling negotiations. Um, in fact, it was uh, uh, Speaker Pelosi and uh, Leader Schumer that went to negotiate with President Trump in the Oval Office around the debt ceiling. And what they demanded was a spending increase uh, and, and demanded that of President Trump. Um, so from uh, from, you know, for the last 40 years, 50 years, the debt ceiling has been the moment in time where Washington takes stock of its fiscal house, of our spending, our ability to pay for that spending, our debt and our deficits. And that is where we are as well. I think it's only responsible and only reasonable to take stock of our fiscal house when we're debating fiscal matters. Um, And so the debt ceiling and government funding are ones where we have to figure out whether or not we can afford the government that we currently have. That government is 30% larger than it was before COVID. That government is taking in record amounts of income, 4.9 trillion this year. That is $1.7 trillion more than what was predicted when we passed the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. Record revenue, record federal spending, and record deficits for as far as the eye can see. And we have important social programs, Medicare, um, Social Security, that will be going broke in the next decade. And when they go broke on, under operation of law, if we do nothing, the the folks that are paid into those systems will see benefit cuts. And so I think that's not the responsible thing to do for those that are on Social Security or that are at or near retirement age. So I think we have to look at those programs and to see how we put them on a sustainable path for future generations. Mm -hmm. And then also see our revenue, which is at record highs as a percentage of the economy and amounts. And how do we pull in that spending within the confines of our ability to pay for it? This is not groundbreaking stuff, 
Uh, this is just uh, responsible budgeting or closer to responsible budgeting than what we've had in the last generation in Washington. You know, you mentioned generations. You're a Gen Xer. Mm-hmm. Historically, no generation has uh, has redistributed more wealth from the rest of America to itself than the baby boomers. Uh, it's it's unqu- it's not even close. I mean, they'll it'll never be topped. I don't believe. And they are, you know, at historic levels of wealth as a generation, particularly compared uh, to millennials uh, and, you know, who've seen an inability to buy homes, an inability to form families, in part due to the challenges that emerge from the financial crisis and other issues related to that. Why is it that we are so reluctant, other than simple electoral politics, to deal with the hard fact that baby boomers have redistributed far too much money to themselves over the course of years, that they have uh, indulged in this well after the point when retirement ages were moving way up, when lifespans were increasing dramatically, and for programs that were meant to serve people at the very end of life, uh, they are now essentially designed to fund lengthy retirements for these same people. Other than the electoral politics element of this, what's the principle that justifies that? Um, well, uh, power. (laughs) So, I mean, look, the the fact is... I appreciate the honesty. (laughs) Well, good. I'm glad that's not going to get me in trouble. Um, No, the the fact is you have an 80-year-old in the White House, Mm -hmm. um, and you have uh, the Senate Majority Leader and now the former Speaker of the House. Um, You have uh, have folks that simply won't retire uh, in the name of keeping power. Mm -hmm. And it's keeping power for themselves, but also for their generation. Mm -hmm. And when you ask folks that are in retirement, do you want to leave your grandkids worse off in in your country than you found it? Um, That, that, to me, that should be a part of the debate. Mm -hmm. Um, And and I think we need to think about where we leave America when we're gone. Um, And I think about that context for my kids. I want to leave them better off and more prepared, um, and, and a country that is better off and more prepared than, than I found it. And mm-hmm. so I mean, th- this seems to be like, outside of politics, a normal conversation that normal people can have, and then you bring it into the political context, and it's, and it's, just, um, it's just removed from that sense of responsibility we have to each other. Mm-hmm. Um, so... Let's try to be like. Let's try to be normal people about this, and not just uh, political beings. <laughs> you know that's okay. I can hope at least, right? I can hope. That's that's no. That's a that's too profound of a thought for the Congress, though. I fear. <laughs> um, mm-hmm. You know, you have uh, right now a slew of new members, uh, including much younger members who are arriving in Washington, uh, who have. Uh, many of them little or no uh, political experience. One of the ramifications of uh, the success of uh, former President Trump is that it drew a lot of new people into politics who didn't have uh, political backgrounds or, you know, come from staffing positions and the like. You know, you had the experience of showing up in, in Washington back in the 2000s and adapting to it, you know, as a younger man. What is the thing that you hope that these new members, fresh to the Congress, learn quickly about the way that the institution works and how can it be guiding them towards something other than simply being a pundit, but with a different pin on their lapel? Well, um, that is the crux of it. If you want to have a platform to be a pundit, you can do it far more easily than getting elected to Congress. I'm proof of that. (laughs) Yes, yes, precisely. (laughs) And it's more liberating. It's far more liberating. Yeah. Um, So, and I find myself doing this. I have to say, well, I'm not a pundit, right? Mm -hmm. I'm a policymaker. I'm a legislator. Um, So what I convey to new members is um, we are legislators primarily. Our craft is legislation, and what we do, whether it's political fundraising, uh, media interviews, oversight, is to drive public policy. Public policy can have a lasting impact, uh, but a tweet doesn't. Well, it can get you into trouble, Mm -hmm. Um, but a 
But all those things lead into the ability to legislate, and legislation should be our outcome. So that is the imprint that I want to make during my time in, in office. Mm -hmm. And in this great country, there have been, you know, um, you know, well over 10,000 members of Congress. Um, and I think I'm, I've been constructive uh, in Congress. But when I'm gone, there'll be somebody else, right? Mm -hmm. And that's the beauty of, of, of this um, institution is that it renews itself in connection with the needs of the American people over time. But the craft is legislation. And we can't forget that. Um, and so I think that's the primary thing. You want to do punditry? Do punditry. Uh, if you want to only do oversight without some legislative outcome or behavioral change in government, then it's just for show. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's my primary focus. Um, that's one. Two, you got to work with people as they are and try to bring them to your perspective and see where you can work together. Because in an institution like ours, in the House, with Republican votes, I can pass what I want out of my committee and out of the House floor. I'm confident I can do that. Um, but if I can work with a few reasonable Democrats and build out policy where we have bipartisan votes, then I can go make lasting policy changes. So we've got to work with people. We've got to work with people and hear their perspective and try to figure out where we get compromise that is principle-based. Um, because I seek an outcome that is very specific and goal oriented. Uh, but along the way, happy to work with you as long as we try to achieve a, a similar goal. The, one of the things that you lived through, though, was the decline and fall of the blue dog Democrat, the, you know, the culturally conservative, pro-military, but pro-union, big spending mm -hmm type of Democrat that we were all familiar with in the in the 90s and, and into the 2000s, you know, those folks are all gone. You know, they, they were the folks who were forcing compromises in the, in the Obamacare fight. You know, it, the cultural sort has really cut off, you know, that uh, that aspect of this. Is it possible to really get Democrat investment when the person who sticks their head, you know, up high enough uh, is going to get slapped by the activist left? you know, for working in any way with those evil Republicans? Well, I think that's why you're seeing rules changes in Congress. It acknowledges the fact that there are fewer folks uh, willing to deal with the other party. And so you see a significant amount of rules changes here in the House to try to further empower the members on the House floor to have an open process and to see what happens, which means uh, we'll have Democrat ideas that are going to get a vote in the House and Republican ideas that get a vote in the House. And people may talk a good game, but you got to show up and vote. Mm -hmm. And there's a red and a green button, and you got to choose. So you may go talk a good game that you are going to be constructive on a particular policy, but when you vote on it and you vote opposite to your rhetoric, it mm -hmm. gets proven out. Um, so I think that will be healthy over time. Um, and I think you'll see some interesting things happen this Congress because we have a more open process. And it may actually show that there is cross-pollinization, um, that there are culturally conservative Democrats somewhere hiding, uh, <laughs> perhaps in plain sight. Maybe. Last question for you, sir. You know, obviously, this is a situation where the Congress uh, does not have the luxury of working with a Republican majority, even a slim one in the Senate. Uh, you obviously aren't going to be able to send as many things because of that to the president's desk. What are the things that you believe ought to be measures of success for this Republican Congress? Meaning that at the end of the day, when you are presumably running for reelection and, and, and your colleagues are, that they're going to be able to go out there and point to, we accomplished this, this, and this uh, because you elected us, and this is why you need to send us back. Well, first, let's, let's give context here. With a Republican House, a Democrat Senate, and a Democrat in the White House, our ability to achieve lasting conservative change is quite limited. But this year tees up the presidential election and 2025. And in 2025, at the end of 2025, you have the individual tax rates expiring from, from uh, the Trump tax cuts. And you have uh, the big plus-ups that the Democrats did to Obamacare, massive spending. Um, uh, that 
they they propped up, and that ends at the twenty at the end of twenty twenty five. So we have a major fiscal cliff there. So what we need to do is make sure that we're driving towards that presidential outcome, that uh, electoral outcome for the Senate and the House, so that you can have unified control in twenty five to tackle that big problem. So we've got to build the oversight process of the value of our tax policy, the value of our economic approach counter to the inflation of of Biden and the Democrats and the overspending of the Democrats. That's really important to tee that up for a policy outcome in 2025. In the meantime, there are things that we can do to help small businesses access credit that I'm focused on the Financial Services Committee and enabling digital innovation through cryptocurrency that I'm focused on in financial services. Areas of uh, data security and data protection against big tech companies and smart policy there that we have an opportunity to move uh, out of the House of Representatives. National security, a focus on national security and returning the intelligence committee that Adam Schiff uh, turned into uh, a, 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 a partisan food fight and getting it back to ensuring Americans protection at home and abroad. There are fundamental things that we can focus on. Finally, a farm bill that uh, helps rural communities and also brings down the, the price of groceries for the average family that's paying dramatically more to feed, you know, to, to feed their family uh, than, than when Biden took office. Um, those things are, I think, achievable things uh, to protect our national security, open up economic pathways that are not currently available, and help families in, in real time. Those are the things I think are achievable this Congress, and those are the things I'm working hard on. Congressman, thank you so much for taking the time to join me today. Great to be with you. Thanks, Ben.